to see again And let the dead man say I am born again Let the side of that river I saw the trees of life. And Yahweh said, who kept the commandments of him and the testimony of Yeshua gets to eat from the trees of life where they'll never die again.
Welcome at this table. Come, all you broken, wounded who believe in the feast of love is ready and waiting. Open your heart to receive. Eat this bread, the broken body of our Lord, and come and drink this cup of the blood of Yeshua being poured out. Keep this faith united with the body of Messiah, and come and drink this cup. Take your place at the table and receive His love. Good to see everyone. Good to be back home. 
the uh, congregations in Thailand are doing well. And uh, where there was one, there is two. So be praying for the transition there and pray for the people there. Send out my love to them. And though I am back home, my heart is still with them too. I have a big heart. I can put it in Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, and even in Temple, Texas. And I pray for them and the success of our movement. Amen. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Praise Yahweh, my soul. Yahweh, my Elohim, your very great. You're clothed with splendor and majesty. Yahweh wraps himself in light as with a garment, and he stretches out the heavens like a tent. Gentlemen, would you please stand? Ladies, would you hold on to your seat seats? Ready? Baruch atah Yahweh, Elecheinu melech haolam, Asher lechanu b'mitzvotav, Vitzivanu l'mitzvot tzitzit. Amen. Which means, Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the doctrine of tzitzit. And here it is. Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a cord of techelet, a unique kind of heavenly blue on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commandments of Yahweh, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourself by chasing after the lust of your own hearts and eyes. And then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your Elohim. Baruch atah Yahweh, Elecheinu melech haolam, Asher Kirishanu Bamehitz Fahotav, Vitsivanu Lahita Tev, Baha Seed Seed. Amen. Which means, Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to enwrap ourselves with Seed Seed. This being our own personal tabernacle, it is the house of Yahweh. And so I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of Yahweh. You may be receded. I will exalt you, Yahweh, for you lifted me up out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Yahweh, my Elohim, I call to you for help and you healed me. You, Yahweh, brought me up from the realm of the dead you spared me from going down to the abyss. Sing the praises of Yahweh, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last only for the night, but joy comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I'll never be shaken. Yahweh, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Yahweh, I call. To Adonai, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I'm silenced, I said. If I go down to the abyss, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Yahweh, and be merciful to me. Yahweh, help me. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Yahweh, my Elohim, I will praise you forever. Oh, 
together the israelites are to observe the sabbath celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant it'll be a sign between me and the israelites forever for in six days yahweh made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed let us all stand and face jerusalem on this beautiful cloudy day and let us make our profession of faith Baruch haba b'shem Yahweh. Blessed is Yahweh who causes the seasons. I just came back from summer. <laughs> so I'm glad to have a little winter. Shema Israel. Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. 
These words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand and let them be frontlets between your eyes. You shall fix them as mezuzahs on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Remain standing as we pray the Nazarene Amidah. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be reseated. Baruch atah Yahweh elechini melech ha'olam asher natan lenu et derek ha-Yeshua b'mashiach Yeshua. All together. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Speedily cause the branch of David thy servant to sprout, and let his horn be exalted by thy salvation, because daily do we wait for thy salvation. Altogether, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, ever how long it takes. I will await his coming every single day. Baku et Yahweh Hamvarek. Bless Yahweh, who is to be praised. Altogether, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh, your Elohim. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so that you may know that I am Yahweh that makes you holy. O Yahweh among the Elohim, who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders?
like you among the Elohim Yahweh there are no deeds like yours your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout the generations Yahweh rules Yahweh has ruled and Yahweh will rule forever and ever Yahweh will give strength to his people and Yahweh will bless his people with wholeness or shalom peace Father of mercy, bestow your favor upon Sion. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And why do the nations of the earth imagine a vain thing against your holy city? For in you alone we trust, Elohim, ruler, high and exalted, master of all the world. <laughs>
and is to come. Who was and is to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Yahweh, you are holy and your name is holy. And the holy ones praise your name every single day. Forever. Blessed are you, the Holy One of Israel. When the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, O Yahweh, and let your enemies be scattered. And let them that hate you flee from you. For from Sion will go forth the Torah and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. Blessed is he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Israel. For it's from Sion that the Torah will go forth and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Blessed is he that gave the Torah to the commonwealth of Israel in holiness. Come forth, Regina, daughter of the Torah. You may be receded. The Torah is at rest. Blessed is Yahweh who is blessed. Blessed is Yahweh who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who chose us from among all the people and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. The Torah portion I will be reading will be Deuteronomy 3, 18 through 22. And I commanded you at that time saying Yahweh your Elohim giving you this land to possess it you shall pass over arm before your brothers and people of Israel all who are fit for the war but your wives and your little ones and your cattle for I know that you have much cattle shall remain in your cities which I have given you until Yahweh has given rest to your brothers as well as to you, and until they also possess the land which Yahweh your Elohim has given them beyond the Jordan. And then shall you return every man to his possession, which I have given you. And I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that Yahweh your Elohim has done to these two kings, so shall Yahweh do all these, do to all the kingdoms which you pass. And you shall not fear them, for Yahweh your Elohim shall fight for you. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and implanted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Come forward, Daryl, you who consider the prophets. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who chose good prophets and was pleased with their words which were spoken in truth. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who chose the Torah, Moses his servant, Israel his people, and the prophets of the truth and righteousness. And I, Yahweh, behold, you have made I'm reading Jeremiah 32, 17, and 21. And I, Yahweh, behold, you are made the heaven and the earth by your great power and by your stretched out arm. And there is nothing hard for you. 
you show loving kindness to thousands and recompense the iniquities of the fathers of the bosom of their children after them. O great and mighty El, Yahweh, host is his name. Great in counsel and might and work, for your eyes are open upon the ways of the sons of man to give the every one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Who signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even to this day, and in Israel, and among mankind, and you may have a name for yourself as this day, and have brought forth your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders, and with strong hand, and with the stretched out arms, and with great terror. Blessed are you, Yahweh, by Elohim, King of the universe, Rock of the ages, righteous in all generations, the Almighty, the Faithful One, who says and does, who speaks and fulfills, for all his words are true and right, for the Torah, for the divine service, for the prophets, and for this Sabbath day, which you have given us, Yahweh our Elohim, for holiness and for rest, for honor and for glory. For all this, Yahweh, our Elohim, we thank you and bless you. Blessed be your name by the mouth of all the living continually forever. Blessed are you, Elohim, sanctifier of the Sabbath. Come forth, forward, please, a faithful disciple of the King. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us his only begotten Son as our Redeemer, and has given a new covenant to the house of Israel, unifying the two into one kingdom, the commonwealth of Israel. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who chose the original twelve apostles to bring this message of renewal to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and has chosen us to carry on that work to sift Israel from the nations, where you scattered them. May this reading stir the heart of your people. The scripture is from Romans 2, 9 through 13. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no respect of persons with Elohim. For as many as have sinned without Torah shall also perish without Torah. And as many as have sinned in the Torah shall be judged by the Torah. For not the hearers of the Torah are just before Elohim, but the doers of the Torah shall be justified. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, for ratifying the new covenant that gives to your people a law of return by the sacrificial blood of your son, King Messiah Yeshua. We thank you for giving us the full messianic message of the kingdom. We proclaim to all the world the kingdom is at hand. For all this, Yahweh, our Elohim, we thank you and bless you. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who has renewed covenant with your people Israel. Come forward, Ed, and bring to Israel the song of truth. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who selected people of praise and was pleased with their worship in spirit and truth. You raised up David, your faithful servant and righteous anointed, the sons of Korah, who brought honor to their house, and righteous worshipers in every generation, to sing songs of delight in your presence, and you inhabit their praise. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. <coughs> This is Psalms chapter 122, Tehillim Perek Kof Kaf Bet, 
verses 1 and 5 through 9. A song of Ma'alot of David, Shir Ha Ma'alot Le David. I was glad when they said to me, Samakti Beomri Li, let us go into the house of Yahweh, Beit Yahweh Nelech. For thrones of judgment were set there. Ki shama yashbu hishot le mashpat, the thrones of the house of David. Kishot levet David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim. Sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim. Those who love you shall prosper. Yish la yu ohai avayik. Peace be within your walls. Yehish shalom behelech and prosperity within your palaces. Shalva ber ar menotayik. For my brothers and companions' sake, lama'an ahai vere ai, I will now say, peace be within you. Adabrana shalom bach. Because of the house of Yahweh, lama'an bet Yahweh, our Elohim, Eloheinu, I will seek your good, avaksha tov lach, avaksha tov lach. May it be your will, Yahweh our Elohim and the Elohim of our ancestors, that you pay heed and mercy to the psalm that I have recited, and may it stand in love, fellowship, and companionship, for we love you and you alone. This is the Torah which Moses placed before the children of Israel. Behold, a good doctrine has been given to you. Yahweh says, My Torah, do not forsake it. Altogether, all that Yahweh has said, we will do and hear. It is the tree of life, which is apropos for today, to those who grasp it and those who support it are blessed. Its ways are the ways of pleasantness and all of its paths are peace. Help us to return to you, Yahweh, and then truly we will return. Renew our days as in the ancient past. Now, is that better? Okay. Tuba Shavat, which uh, the T and the U, if I can use that, the, the, is the f letter 15. 
to be Shabbat is the 15th of Shabbat, the month of Shabbat, and is the new year for the trees. And for the next few minutes, I'll be sharing with you uh, the information on this holy day, where we get it, why we celebrate it, and how we will celebrate it. The word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then Yahweh said to me, You have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12. The 15th day of Shavat alludes to the secret of the sacred name, Yahweh, whose first two letters, Yod, He, which represents the heavenlies, equals 15. And the last two letters, Bob and He, that represent the earthly, equals 11. The full secret of the name Yahweh is the secret of the tree of life. The tree of life that is Jacob's ladder, a portal into heaven. The tree of the month of Shavuot. The earth is Yahweh's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, says Psalms 24 and 1. And Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree that has seed yielding fruit. To you it shall be for food. Genesis 1 and 29. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her, and those who lay hold of her will be blessed, says Proverbs 3, 13 and 18. Do you see a constant throughout these passages? The reality that the tree of life, once a physical tree that stood in the midst of the Garden of Eden, the Torah, which is the tree of life to all those that can attain to it, and the wisdom of that Torah. She is a tree of life to those that embrace her. There are four new years, says the Talmud. On the first of Aviv is the new year for festivals. It's the new year of your months. On the first of Elul is the new year for the tithe of animals. On the first of Tishri is the new year for the years. For the Shemitah, the sabbatical, and for the Yovel, or the Jubilee years. For the sapling and for the vegetables. It's the agricultural new year, in other words. On Shavuot is the new year for the tree, according to Hillel. It's on the 15th of the month. How do we know that we've gotten it right? Well, last night began the 15th. And it began at sundown. And when I looked into the heavens, what did we see? A beautiful full moon which means it's the 15th of the month. Again, going to the Talmud, it says, If one picked fruit from an etrog tree on the eve of the 15th of Shabbat before the sun went down, and he picked it, more of its fruit after the sun went down, we may not separate the tithes from each batch for the other, either from the new crop or for the old, or from the old crop for the new one. Says the Talmud, Rosh Hashanah, 14b. When you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years you are to consider it forbidden. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year all its fruit will be holy, an offering of praise to Yahweh. But in the fifth year you may eat its fruit. In this way your harvest will be increased. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Says Leviticus 19, 23-25. It is the right time to plant trees. On the 15th, two in Hebrew, we plant new trees which will grow strong and tall. Tuba Shavat was the beginning of the counting of the fruit crops for tithes. The gift consisted of one-tenth of the harvest. It's given by the farmer to the priest. And since we no longer are an agricultural-based society, it is when we bring an estimated 1% of our annual income to who is doing the work of the priest. Today the Nazarene rabbi is the minister of Messiah Yeshua to the nations with the priestly duty of proclaiming the full message of Yahweh so that the nations might become an offering acceptable to Yahweh. 
the planting of Yahweh, in other words, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Messiah Yeshua in my service to Yahweh, says Romans 15, 16, and 17. The map of the graces, or the ten manifestations of Yahweh, is called the Tree of Life. And most of you have seen me. I wear that around my neck most of the time. And most of these manifestations are mentioned in the Chronicles. Praise be to you, O Yahweh, the Elohim of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Yahweh, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Yahweh, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as Rosh, or head, over all. And Yahweh Elohim planted a garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed man whom he had formed. Says Genesis 2 and 8. That leads us back to the tree, the original tree of life. And out of the ground made Yahweh Elohim to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Says Genesis 2 and 9. So what garden are we talking about? We're talking about the garden of Eden. Pardis. You've heard that word. It's been anglicized into the word paradise. But you probably don't know what that means. You have a misconception of what you think paradise is. To the Muslim, it's 72 virgins with land flowing with milk and honey and wine. That's not pardis. To the Christian, it's a place where you will play harps and do nothing all day. That's not pardis. Pardis means an orchard or a garden. The Garden of Yahweh. Now, the original Garden of Eden was located in the land of Eden. The Garden of Eden and the land of Eden are two different things. The Garden of Eden was located in the land of Eden. Now, where's the land of Eden? Well, when you look on the map, you have the Tigris and the Euphrates. There were four, four rivers. The Tigris and the Euphrates, and they all flowed into the Persian Gulf. And then you had the Pishon that flowed right down through here. And then, oh, that was the Gihon. And then the Pishon, which flowed, when this was all a beautiful rich valley, it flew, flowed right into here and became what we know as the Nile today. Now you can see this as fossilized rivers in this satellite map. You can see how that the Tigris and the Euphrates, they flow right down through here. But you can also see an ancient river and then it's down in the bottom of the, the sea here. You can see that it used to be a river flowing down through here. And the same here, you can see, and you see the other part of it here and then it empties and then you start seeing it coming up right through here, flowing down, becoming the Nile. So all e Eden was everything from here to here. But where was the garden? The garden was in the midst of what we now know as Jerusalem. The Garden of Eden had two sections. The first, or an inner area, was the place where Yahweh communed with Adam and Hava, or Eve. And this area corresponds to the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. The man and his wife heard the sound of Yahweh as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Genesis 3 and 8. Now, Yeshua said, no man has seen Yahweh at any time. He reveals Yahweh to man. So who walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Hava? The express image of Yahweh Colossians 1.15 declares that Yeshua is that express image or that bodily representation of Yahweh. The inner area was Mount Moriah or Mount Moriah, the center of Jerusalem. Underneath Mount Moriah or Moriah flows the underground river of Gihon. You mean it still flows? Yes. And does it flow? 
Brother Steve, did they show you where the waterfalls was and how it was gushing in with, I mean, just powerful. Did, they, did you get to go through that in Hezekiah's tunnels? Wasn't that amazing how hard that river flows? It is a strong river that flows underneath the city. And that was the secret of Jerusalem, how it could stay hydrated even though it be surrounded for years. An ancient Midrash is all too relevant for today. And I quote, In the hour when the Holy One, blessed be he, created the first person, he showed him the trees in the garden and said to him, See my works, how fine they are? Now all that I have created, I created for your benefit. Think upon this and do not corrupt and destroy my world. For if you do, if you destroy it, there's no one to restore it after you. Says Ecclesiastes Rabbah 7.28. In other words, you can't help yourself. I'll have to insert myself into creation. And we know that he can't, he comes to his own, but his own can't contain him. In the Zohar it says, Jerusalem is the center of the earth and a heavenly place called Sion is above it. And from this place it is blessed and the two are indissolubly linked together. And this is what the world doesn't understand is that Jerusalem is holier than the earth on which it stands. Because not all of Jerusalem is on this earth. There's a Jerusalem above and the Jerusalem below. And you cannot divide them. It was the first piece of land that rose from the primordial waters of creation. According to the sages, Adam was created from the dust of Mount Moriah. Here the temple was built and that housed the Shekinah, the divine presence of Yahweh, in the Holy of Holies. And without a doubt, Mount Moriah is of primary importance in Yahweh's redemptive work. And here you can see how this underground river flows uh, through Jerusalem. It was from the word that we learn who has been trying to keep from us the reality that our world is broken today. And that person is the turncoat, Halel bin Shakar Yalal, the Lucifer. In Ezekiel it says, Halel bin Shakar Yalal, that the world knows as Lucifer, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You are the anointed Karuv, or the guardian, who covers the heavenly throne. I established you, you were on the holy mountain of El, or Sion. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones, or the faceted stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. You were in Eden, the garden of El. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day that you were created. Ezekiel 28, 12, 14, 15, and 13. The holy mountain of Yahweh is Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Today, today Mount Moriah forms the temple mount. Yahweh selected Mount Moriah as the site of his temple. Therefore, the Holy Scriptures clearly connect Jerusalem to the site of the original Garden of Eden. It was in this inter intersection you find the tree of life. The sages taught that Yahweh transplanted the tree of life into the Garden of Eden. In Revelations 2, 7, Yeshua states, To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise, or the pardis, or the orchard of Yahweh. There are two ways of growing a tree. From a zeriah, or an implanting, and a summing. A se or excuse me, a the zeria is a seedling and the samic is a implanting. And Yahweh Elohim made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground uh, trees and they were pleasing to the eye and good for food in the midst or in the middle of the garden, the tree of life. Genesis 2, 9. Yahweh made the tree of life grow out of the ground. A samic. The term there used is samic, which meant that the planting had not been done in this soil of the garden but elsewhere the tree of life had been implanted or more correctly transplanted this concept of transplantation of the tree of life 
is highly significant for it will tie into another profound possibility that even a branch from this tree could be successfully transplanted later for a most important reason. There's a book that I enjoy reading. I read it two or three times a year. It's called The Rod of an Almond Tree. And I quote from that book. An essential clue relating to the tree of life is found in the earliest known name for Mount Moriah, Luz. It means almond tree in Aramaic, in Arabic, and Ethiopic. According to the Torah anthology, the city of Luz was associated with the immense almond tree. End of quote. Chapter 5, Tree of Life, page 113. According to Genesis 28:19, and Jacob called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Why had Jacob called this place the house of El? It had a name, Luz, the city of the almond tree. But he renamed it Bethel, or Beit El. Mount Moriah in Jerusalem was the very site of Jacob's dream, if it was a dream at all. The mountain opposite Moriah, to the east, is the Mount of Olives. The, section, the second section for the garden was the outer remainder area of the garden that separated the garden from the rest of Eden. This section correlates to the holies and the rest of Eden with the court. When Adam fell, he was expelled from the garden, but was allowed to live in Eden. At the time of Adam's expulsion from the garden, Yahweh gave a branch of the tree of life to Adam. The branch or staff was engraved with the ineffable name of Yahweh. So he drove the man out at the east of the Garden of Eden. He stationed the Keravim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Genesis 3, 24. According to the Torah anthology, written by Rabbi Yaakov Kuli, one of the greatest Sephardic sages of his time, first published in 1730, translated by Rabbi Ari Kaplan, Adam constructed the first sacrificial altar to Yahweh Elohim. The tree of life was, out mo- was on mo- Mount Moriah and Adam was expelled east of the garden. Therefore, the sacrificial altar must have been constructed on the Mount of Olives. Following this, the same altar was successfully rebuilt by Abel, Noah, and Abraham. In the passages in Genesis that deal with this subject, the Hebrew word bena has been translated built in most of the English versions of the scripture. However, the New Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible indicates that this word may also be translated as rebuilt or restored, which in fact more accurately describes the reality. It was in this area just outside the eastern gate that later Cain and Abel built their altar, or rebuilt the altar, to petition Elohim whom they considered inside the inner garden. This historic altar came to be associated with the altar of burnt offerings located just east of the holy place of the tabernacle and later in the temple. The sages have all commented that the land of Eden that extended from the river Gihon to the river Pishon was symbolic of the court of the Israelites in the tabernacle and later in the temple to include the extended area around the sanctuaries which came to be called the camp of Israel. The camp of Israel limits had been set by the Beit Din or the Supreme Court of Israel as being an imaginary circle around the sanctuary with a radius of 2,000 cubits. According to the Talmud, Rosh Hashanah 2.5 and Sanhedrin 1.5 and Shavuot 2.2. Returning to the scripture in Genesis 2. And out of the ground Yahweh caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden towards the garden and from there it divided and became four rivers. So it started as one river and it divided into four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. That will later become the Nile. Flows around the whole of the land of Havilah or Arabia where there is a gold and the gold of that land is good and Bedlam and the onyx stone are there and the name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush or Ethiopia, and the name of the third river is Tigris, and it flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. 
Genesis 2, 8 through 14. So you can see this as set up like the tabernacle. When you come in, you're coming in through the east of Eden into the land of Eden. The first thing you come to is the altar of Cain and Abel. It originally was Adam's altar. Then as you go in, there are the two Keravim, the guardians, that will take you into the garden. And in the middle of the garden was where the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil stood. One river that divides into four rivers. The Euphrates to the northeast of Israel flows through Iraq to the Persian Gulf. The Hedekel, or the Tigris, which we know flows between Iraq and Iran, again flowing into the Euphrates as it joins the Persian Gulf. The other two rivers are unknown to us, by at least that's what the historians say. One of these rivers, the Gihon, flows from the Euphrates' source down through Israel, underground, under the Sea of Galilee, to the, mount, the Temple Mount, where it forms the Spring of Gihon, and continues down the Nile River to Ethiopia, which has always been viewed as being south of Egypt. And that would place the Pishon flowing from the Euphrates source down to the present-day Mediterranean Sea. And guess what is at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea? A rift that's over 10,000 feet deep. A fossilized riverbed, in other words. In places, it is up to 12,960 feet below sea level and into the Red Sea, or Havilah. The Talmud indicates that all of the water in the world originated in Eden. Cain was expelled out of the land of Eden for murdering his brother Abel to the east to the land of Nod, or the land of wanderings, which became the land of the Gentiles outside the sanctified regions of Eden. Now listen to what Yahweh says to Cain. He says, sin is at the door. It desires is for you. You must master it. If you do right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do right, sin is crouching at the door. A desire is for you. You must master it, says Genesis 4, 7. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my Elohim. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my Elohim, and I will also write on them my new name. Revelations 3 and 12. Sin lieth at the door, Yahweh had warned Cain. He wanted Cain to become a broken and a contrite spirit. Yahweh would have accepted him. But instead he embraced that sin, didn't he? To master the sin already committed, Cain had to make a sin offering. This offering had to be applied alive at the door. And this door was actually at the entrance of the land of Eden. The door where Cain's sacrifice had to be placed was located at the eastern boundary line between the land of Nod and the land of Eden. Since Cain viewed Yahweh as manifesting himself in the inner area of the garden, Cain's sacrifice had to be on an altar facing Yahweh in the inner sanctuary of the garden. We know what happened to Cain. Cain did repent. Yahweh still sent him wandering in the land of Nod. But he died having a relationship with Yahweh. But violence begins violence. Cain was killed. He did not die a natural death. Adam handed down the branch of the tree of life to Enoch and then to Methuselah. From Methuselah, it would have been transferred to Shem, the son of Noah. Shem was also the head of an academy teaching Yahweh's knowledge and was Abraham's tutor, says the Torah anthology. In the 15th year of the life of Abram, son of Terah, Abram came forth out of the house of Noah, where Shem was, and went to his father's house. And Abram knew Yahweh. How did he know Yahweh? Shem taught him. And he went in his ways and in instruction, and Yahweh, his Elohim, was with him, says the book of Jasher. 11, 13 through 14. In Genesis it says, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Isn't it interesting how in the land of Israel they always make note of great trees. Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar 
there to Yahweh who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. And with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to Yahweh and called upon the name of Yahweh. Where did he learn that name? In the Torah school of Shem. Genesis 12, 6 to 8. Because Terah wasn't going to teach him. Terah was serving false gods. It is evident that Abram returned to this altar on the Mount of Olives at the time Yahweh Elohim made a covenant with him in Genesis 15. This covenant or promise was sealed by the blood sacrifice of animals and was symbolic of the greater covenant to come, the covenant sealed by the blood sacrifice of Yeshua, the Messiah that is available to all who put their trust in him. In making his covenant with Abraham, Yahweh revealed significant details of his redemptive plan for humankind, including the place where the ultimate sacrifice would take place. Again, the rod of an almond tree, page 83. In the Jewish Encyclopedia, it says, according to one account, on Joseph's death, the Egyptian noble stole some of his belongings, and among them, Jethro appropriated the staff. Jethro planted the staff in his garden when its marvelous virtue was revealed by the fact that nobody could withdraw it from the ground. Even to touch it, it was fraught with danger to life. This was because of the ineffable name of Yahweh was engraved upon it. Could this be where the Legend of Excalibur came from. When Moses entered Jethro's household, he read the name and by means of it was able to draw up the rod from which service Zipporah, Jethro's daughter, was given to him in marriage. Again, says the Jewish Encyclopedia, end of quote. So like a baton in a relay, we see this rod being transferred down from Adam and now to Moses. For 40 years, Moses lived with Jethro, his father-in-law, who was a priest of El in the area of Arabia, east of Aqaba, according to Zondervan's Pictorial Encyclopedia. At the burning bush, Yahweh gives Moses his mission, his name, and the authority to lead Israel. When Moses asked by what sign the people will believe him, Yahweh referred to the rod. When Moses asked why or by what name he was to come in, Yahweh referred him to the name engraved upon the rod, Yahweh. During the spiritual battle between Moses and Pharaoh, the rod once again was used. When Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show a miracle for yourself, then you shall say to Aharon, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aharon went in to Pharaoh and they did so. Just as Yahweh commanded, and Aharon cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt. They also did in the manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aharon's rod swallowed up their rods. Exodus 7, 9 through 12. The difference is, Pharaoh's magicians did it by sleight of hand. They were illusionists. But Yahweh's rod given to these men actually ate up the snakes of the Egyptians. As Pharaoh's heart hardened, Yahweh sent ten plagues to break Pharaoh initiated through the rod. After the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh relented and let the children of Israel go. Then he changed his mind and chased the children of Israel to the Red Sea. The Yom Idan. Again, the rod in the hand of Moses split the Red Sea, giving the children of Israel safe passage while crashing in on the Pharaonic forces of Egypt. Remember when the children of Israel went out into the wilderness and they wanted water and they tried to mutiny. But Yahweh used two things the Bethel stone that had been carried with the children of Israel, the same stone that Jacob lay his head on, and the rod. The Bethel stone was the stone of help. It was an Ebenezer. When the people were without water at Kadesh, a city that bordered of Edom near Petra, here Moses and Aharon are beginning to show signs of fatigue. And why have you brought up the congregation of Yahweh into the wilderness that we and our cattle should die here? Wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us 
into this evil place. It is no place of seed, nor figs, or vine, nor pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. This is Numbers 20, 4 and 5. There was nothing there but red dirt. <coughs> In their time of exasperated need, Yahweh appeared to Moses. Take the rod. And gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aharon thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall, be, it shall give forth this water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. Says Numbers 20 and 8. So the commonwealth of Israel was commanded by authority of the rod to gather before the rock. And they clearly understood which rock it was, the Bethel stone was the same rock used at Raphadim and at Kadesh. This was just no mere stone. This was the Bethel stone that represented Messiah, the rock of our salvation. And this is alluded to by Rabbi Shaul in 1 Corinthians. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, the manna, all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Messiah. Now these things happened to them as an example. and They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4 and 11. So why are we told about this story? We're told about it as our example that will be living at the end of the age. And I believe this is the last generation. So we need to understand the importance of these things. And notice what it says. Even though these were physical things, they had spiritual attributes. When in the desert, the spiritual authority of Moses and Aharon was challenged, Yahweh said to assert the rod. Speak to the children of Israel and get from them a rod from each father's house. All their leaders according to their father's houses, 12 rods. Write each man's name on his rod, and you shall write Aharon's name on the rod of Levi, for there shall be one rod for the head of each ho father's house. The rod of the man whom I chose will blossom. Thus I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they make against you. The next day the rod of Aharon, which was shared by him and Moses, produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. Number 17, 2-8. Wait a minute, this, this rod had been out of the ground for years. All of a sudden, it decided to blossom. And not just blossom, but produce fruit. Interesting. But Yahweh was going to show the importance of the delegated authority and this rod. So by proclamation, the rod of Moses and Aharon had used was to be placed in the tabernacle. And he always said to Moses, bring Aharon's rod back before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels that you may put their complaints away from me lest they die. Numbers 17 and 10. So from that time on, the things in the holy place were the Ark of the Covenant with on top of it was the mercy seat, symbolic of the throne of Yahweh. On one side, Aaron's rod was stuck into the ground. And it still was blossoming and still producing fruit. On the other side was the bowl of manna. Directly in front of the curtain in the holy place where the blossoming Aaron's rod was, was the menorah. And the command was, make it look like an almond tree. Opposite the manable was the bread of the presence. Opposite the mercy seat was the incense altar. So you had a representation in the holy place of what was in the holy of holies. Moses said unto Haron, Take one pot and put there the fullness of the omer of manna and let it rest before Yahweh for a change for your generations. As Yahweh hath given commandment unto Moses, so doth Aaron let it rest before the testimony for a charge. Exodus 16, 33 and 34. Behind the second veil is the sanctuary that is called the Holy of Holies and which is placed the, 
the ark covered on all sides with gold and with a mercy seat. And also in the Holy of Holies is the gold bowl of manna and the rod of Aharon, also the cubes of the covenant. Hebrews 9, 3-4. There was nothing in the ark save the two cubes of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when Yahweh made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came up out of the land of Egypt. 1 Kings 8 and 9. So contrary to some Christian commentators, there was only one thing inside the Ark of the Covenant, two solid cubes of sapphire. For what's inside the sapphire was engraved the Ten Commandments. Directly in front of that on one side was Aharon's rod stuck in the ground. And on the other side was the bowl of manna. But they were not inside the Ark of the Covenant. They were before the testimony or before the Ark. When the children of Israel sinned in the wilderness and spoke against Yahweh and against Moses. We read, Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against Yahweh and against you. Pray to Yahweh that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then Yahweh said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it upon the pole or the rod. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it upon the rod. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Numbers 21, 6 to 8. This pole or rod was the ancient branch of the tree of life that Yahweh had so mightily used down through the ages. The children needed a miracle fast, so Yahweh told Moses to go and get the rod that stood in front of the presence and fashion a crossbeam to it and place a brass serpent on it. And if the people looked on it, they would be healed. It's interesting to note that the Hebrew word for almond is shekhad, from the root word shekhad, meaning to be watchful or to be in a hurry. According to the rabbinical commentary, Stories passed down through the generations. The rod transferred from Adam successfully down the line to Enoch, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and David. According to the Midrash, Yahalem Danu, and I quote, the staff with which Jacob crossed the Jordan is identical with that which Judah gave to his daughter-in-law Tamar in Genesis 32, 10, and 38, 18. It is likewise the holy rod with which Moses worked in Exodus 4, 20 through 21, which also Aharon performed the wonders before Pharaoh in Exodus 7 and 10, and with which finally David slew the giant Goliath in 1 Samuel 17 and 40. When Israel needed another miracle in the form of a fearless lad named David, the rod was once again brought to bring deliverance. And I want you to read this with me because... This is huge. Then he took his staff for the rod in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was within his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him and when the Philistine looked about and saw David he disdained him for he was only a youth ruddy and good looking. So the Philistines said to him, now listen to what he says. Am I a dog that you should come before me with sticks? Not stones, but sticks, this rod in David's hand. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, now listen to what he says. You come to me with a sword and with a spear, with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of Yahweh Zevaot. How could he do that? He did it because that was the name that was on the rod in his hand. The Elohim of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. 1 Samuel 17, 40 through 45. Now we know what happened, don't we? We know that he was successful. And that David slew Goliath that day. The last of the remnants of giants, the Raphadim, the walking dead, those that had no true spirit, just an animalistic soul. Later on in David's life, this will come again, this importance of the rod. 
In 1 Chronicles 21, we find where David is instructed by the angel of Yahweh to build an altar to Yahweh on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. The angel of Yahweh commanded God to say to David that David should go and erect an altar to Yahweh on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar on it to Yahweh. You shall ground it to me at the full price, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. David built there an altar to Yahweh and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on Yahweh and he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offerings. First Chronicles 21, 18, 22, 25, and 26. God came to da- that day to David and said to him, Go up and erect an altar to Yahweh on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Second Chronicles 3, 1. Again, quoting from the rod and the almond tree, Peter Mikhas wrote, It is highly significant that gold was used to purchase this particular site because gold represents deity in the Bible. Indeed, the divine presence, as manifested by the Shekinah, or the glory cloud, dwelt in the Holy of Holies on top of Mount Moriah. This was the exact place that David now has bought back for Yahweh. However, that wasn't the only place he bought. It's not the only site that David was instructed to purchase for the express purpose of an erecting an altar to Yahweh. And God came the next day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to Yahweh on the threshing floor of Erinah, the Jebusite. And Erinah said, Why has my lord the king come to this servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you to build an altar to Yahweh, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. And then the king said to Erinah, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to Yahweh my Elohim with that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built there an altar to Yahweh and, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So Yahweh heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from the city. 2 Samuel 24, 18, 21, 24, and 25. Now the threshing floor of Arnon was inside the city. On the Temple Mount. But the threshing floor of Aranua was outside the city on the Mount of Olives. It's clearly evident from these verses that the threshing floor of Arana, purchased for 50 shekels of silver, is separate and distinct from the threshing floor of Arnon, purchased for 600 shekels of gold. Here, the threshing floor of Arana. David rebuilt an altar that Ezekiel said was outside the sanctuary in Ezekiel 43.21. This is the least understood of all the altars, but it was still an important piece of the Torah sacrificial system. It was an, on this altar, one of the most mystical of all sacrifices was totally consumed. The ashes of the red heifer. Understanding the relation this altar had to Cain, this altar stood outside the ancient boundary of Eden. Geographically, where did this altar stand? It stood near the southern summit of the Mount of Olives, just outside the camp of Israel, which meant it was outside the land of Eden. This place was a sanctuary unto itself, for Ezekiel says it was the outer sanctuary that's looking eastward, Ezekiel 44 and 1 says. David moved the tabernacle once he had been made king to Mount Moriah. Now the wondrous almond branch had come full circle. This branch of the tree of life once again stood in the garden of Yahweh. That's true that the garden had been lifted up into the heavenlies, but it's still the presence of that garden you can still sense in the holy city today. And once again, when the new Jerusalem comes down, the paradise of Yahweh, the orchard of Yahweh, the garden of Yahweh will be in its rightful place. The first time we see The Mount of Olives, mentioned by name in the scripture, is when David escapes from Jerusalem during the coup attempt of his son Absalom. David had to flee the city for his life. The account you can read in 2 Samuel 15. All the country wept with a loud voice and all the people crossed over. The king himself also crossed over the Wadi Kidron. And all the people crossed 
over towards the way of the wilderness. There was Zadok also and all the Levites with him bearing the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh. And they set down the Ark of Yahweh and Abiatar went up until all the people had finished crossing over from the city. They were abandoning the city. If I find favor in the eyes of Yahweh, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says thus, I have no delight in you, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. And the king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahamaz your son, and Jonathan the son of Abiatar. See, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until the word comes from you to inform me. So he said, Take the ark, and, and you priests get back to the temple mount. This isn't... You're, that's, this is no reason, this coup attempt is no reason to stop the holy service of Yahweh. You go back. Are you not a seer? Don't you discern things? This problem between Absalom and me is a spiritual battle. But this has nothing to do with you. You go back and do the things you're supposed to do. But there was a problem. David had Aaron's rod in his hand. And it had to stand, remember what it, it had to stand at least 2,000 cubits in front of the testimony to stay in the camp. Therefore Zadok and Abiatar carried the ark of Yahweh back to Jerusalem and they remained there. So David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up and he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up to the head to the head, to the Rosh of the mountain where he worshipped Yahweh. 2 Samuel 15, 23 through 30 and 32. What was so special about this place? David wept as he crossed over the Mount of Olives. And what did he weep? My Elohim, my Elohim, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, Oh, my Elohim, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of man, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They, they shake their heads, saying, He trusted in Yahweh. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. Psalms 22. <laughs> There's just one problem. They didn't do that to David. This never happened to David. But he's crying this nonetheless. He's feeling this nonetheless. While David is walking up the summit, he has an epiphany. David was living out the vision of these events and then directed by Yahweh to plant the rod, knowing it would become the instrument of redemption for all mankind. He begins to transcend time and feel the agony that will take place a thousand years later. Then he understands as David thrusts the rod into the ground on the Mount of Olives, just as stones throw from the third altar and he says Yahweh is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pasture he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death this Kidron Valley I'll fear no evil for you're with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup. My kiddush runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell. I'll dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Psalms 23. The only way David could pass over the Kidron Valley was by the way of the archstone bridge which connected the Temple Mount Moriah to the Mount of Olives. The Mishnah in Para 
three six para is the cow mentions this bridge a thousand years later the messiah the descendant of david would also walk this same route over the kidron valley on a single bridge that was part of the temple complex remodeled by herod this archstone bridge and the later one provided the only ritual clean path by which the priest could take sin offerings from the tabernacle or temple to the summit of the mount of olives the site of the sin sacrifice altar according to peter minkas again uh, from his book the stone arch over arch design of the bridge ensured that the priests were protected from ritual unclean uncleanness such as the remains of dead bodies below end of quote after crossing the kidron bridge david followed the pathway which ascended the mount of olives to harosh the head of the summit where yahweh was worshiped second samuel 15:31 the Hebrew word harosh translated in most scriptures as the summit however these words can also be translated as the head or the skull for a very good reason note that the verse in questions calls this site the place of the head or the skull not a place of a skull but the skull a literal particular skull Early Messianics held a unique understanding concerning the Mount of Olives. And Christendom said it like this. Some say that Adam died there, and there lieth, and that Yeshua in that place where death had reigned, there also set up the trophy. Tensasulus, in his book Nomial Treaties, quoted in Sotheby's Ammonia, volume 1, page 281, records this amazing episode in ancient history. And I quote, the tree of life with the bones of Adam was preserved in the ark of Noah who divided the relics among his sons. The skull fell into the share of Shem, Noah's son, who buried it in a mount of Judea called from this circumstance Calvary or Golgotha, the place of the skull. The Arabic word Golgotha or more correctly in Hebrew, Golagoleta, found in Matthew 27, 33, Mark 15, 22, and Luke 23, 33. And John 19, 17 literally means the place of the skull or harosh. That Adam's skull was buried in Galagoleta on the Mount of Olives was a common knowledge. Origen speaks of it as a well-known fact in his time. St. Augustine wrote, the ancients hold that because Adam was the first man was buried there at Golgotha. It was called Calvary because it holds the head of the human race. End of quote. Basil said, and I quote, probably Noah was not ignorant of the sepulcher of our forefather Adam and that of the firstborn of all mortals. And in that place, Calvary, the Lord suffered the origin of death there being destroyed. End of quote. Galagoleta, or Golgotha, is named from Adam's skull, the summit of the Mount of Olives, the site of the red heifer altar, the place where Yahweh was worshipped. Even Hebrew translations of the Messianic scriptures use the words harosh to refer directly to the, circum, the, to the crucifixion site. Thou shalt take the bullock also of the sin offering and he shall burn it in the appointed place of the house without or outside the sanctuary. Ezekiel 43 and 21. Looking from the eastern gate, there you see harosh or that place of the summit. The word's appointed place in Hebrew is the word mithkat. Mithkat comes from the verb pakad, which means to number. The appointed place was called the mithkat altar. It was here where the people registered for the temple tax. Each person had a head count and was taxed at this location. The word galagaleta used in the messianic accounts is described the place of the crucifixion, which means the skull, head, or pole. It is the place of the head count. And the silver of them that were numbered, pachad, to appoint or to number, of the congregation was a hundred talents and a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. A becha for every man. Galagalet, head. That is a half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary for every one that went to be numbered, or pachad. Exodus 38, 25 through 26. In the time of Messiah Yeshua, this place of numbering or registration for the temple tax was called Golgolet. This was the Mithkad area of the Mount of Olives, east of the temple, 
and near the place outside the city where the bodies of sacrifices were burned. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Yeshua also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. Hebrews 13, 11 through 13. The tabernacle, later the temple, was made up of three main sections. The Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the Court. It also had three altars. The altar of incense, the brazen altar of burnt offerings, but a third altar that was outside the camp on the Mount of Olives. The innermost section was the Holy of Holies located in the western part of the sanctuary. This is where the concentrated presence of Yahweh sitting on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant faced eastward to view the workings of the altar. The second section includes the holy place where the Aaronic priests offer incense on the golden altar and the Levites make burnt offerings on the brazen altar. The third altar is located directly outside the eastern gate over the ravine called the Wadi Kadron. The third altar called the Beit Hadashan or the House of the Ashes was a permanent place on the slope of the Mount of Olives that allowed the ashes to drain down the hill into the Kidron to fertilize the fields maintained by the priest. In the time of Rabbi Yeshua, there was an arched bridge called the Bridge of the Para Adama, or the Red Heifer, that led from the Golden Eastern Gate across the Wadi Kidron to the third altar on the summit, or the Harosh, of the Mount of Olives. This causeway is called the Descent of the Mount of Olives in Luke 19, 37. The Red Heifer being taken to a clean place outside the camp that refers to a specific location, a clean place outside the camp. The word used here is Mithkad. You'll also find it in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is, is setting about to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the gate, and he comes to the gate of Mithkad. Mithkad means the appointed gate. The word Mithkad in Hebrew appears other places in Scripture where it is translated appointed. It is the gate on the eastern wall of the Temple Mount, and that red heifer was led out, and its lead crossed the Kidron Valley to the altar of Mithkad, the appointed place in the clean place where the red heifer was sacrificed. There is no doubt that Yeshua was led like the red heifer through the temple, through the eastern gate, across the Kidron Bridge, and up the ascent to the Mount of Olives to the summit. The third altar is located directly outside the eastern gate over the ravine called the Wadi Kidron. And the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, What do you see? He said, I see the branch of an almond tree. Yahweh said, you've seen well, for I'm ready to perform my word. Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12. On that almond tree, Yeshua was hung. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. So Yeshua also had to suffer outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore, Hebrews 13, 10 through 13. All the rest of the bull must be taken outside the camp to a place ceremonially clean where the ashes are thrown and burn it into the wood fire on the place of the pouring out of the ashes, says Leviticus 4 and 12. We'll stop there. But we'll pick it up after the meal because this is too important let go of until you understand all the ins and outs of this place of the skull this almond tree the importance of this rod and this tree of life on this the holy day of the trees amen let's all stand isn't it good to study Yahweh's word see how it all fitly joins together but right now I'm hungry how about you the humble will eat and be satisfied those who seek Yahweh will praise him may your hearts live forever Psalms 22 and 26 Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Mine Mazanot Baruch Atah Yahweh Elohenu melech haolam, bore pri ha adama, baruch ata Yahweh. 
Elecheinu melech haolam, Sher hakol niye bidvaro. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who creates various kinds of sustenance, creator of the fruit of the earth, by whose word all things came to be. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Yahweh, my strength and my redeemer. We thank you for the opportunity of searching your word. You have separated us by your commandments and you commanded us to engross ourselves in the study of your word. And in that study, you show us great marvelous things out of your word. Such as the importance of the tree of life. When we have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless Yahweh your Elohim for the good land which he has given you. It says Deuteronomy 8 and 10. B'shem Yeshua. We say all this in the name of Yeshua. Let's eat. Amen. We'll be taking up as you leave. Um, Donna, would you please put the Zadaka box on the altar? It is a commandment that we bring in at least... A, an offering and it's customary to put in one percent of your annual income into that um zodica box so we'll be placing it on the altar here in front of the bima just make your pay checks payable to agada bris and we'll put it in there again remember what we had read the um offering today uniquely goes to me <laughs> as the priest of the new covenant so uh, we'll be placing that right in front. So we thank you for your blessing beforehand. Uh, Yahweh is always so liberally blessing us. And we thank him for it. Again, let's eat and celebrate the manifold blessings of the trees. We know that so many of you brought fruit and nuts and things grown on trees. So let's eat them. <laughs>